Hi, I'm uh, Mary Williams, and I'm pleased to be with you this evening and talking about um, your skin in our changing world. Uh, skin is not the first thing that comes to mind when most people think about climate change and how it's affecting our health and well-being. Even most doctors aren't worrying about it. And yet if we step back a moment and, and give this a second thought, isn't it strange? And skin, after all, is the most exposed of all our organs and it, it uh, encounters everything around us. And yet it's not demanding our attention. We may worry about climate change and extreme weather events and the health of other parts of our body, our lungs, our brain, our heart, but they're all residing inside the protective garment of our skin. So today I'd like to take a look at both how skin protects us and also how it is vulnerable to the changes in our world. Skin has many functions, as this drawing illustrates, keeping both the outside world out and the inside world in keeping out foreign chemicals, microorganisms, such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, and protecting us from harm from sunlight or physical blows, while at the same time holding in our internal world, and especially holding in our water. Providing a barrier against water loss is, in fact, the number one function of skin. It's its most important duty, because we're mostly water, 70%, and yet we live on dry land. From time eons past, when our fishy ancestors first crawled out of the isotonic world of the seas to attempt to live on dry land, they needed a waterproof covering. And virtually every terrestrial plant since that time, plant, animal, uh, has evolved some sort of protective water barrier on its integument. As it turns out, the water barrier of human skin is also the same barrier that protects us against many of these external assaults. And because these assaults are what's changing in our world, let's take a look at how skin constructs its water barrier. Here we have a drawing of skin, may be familiar to many of you. The largest portion uh, is the lower part, the dermis, and this is uh, mostly fibrous. It's where the blood vessels and nerves live. Uh, we, the hair follicles originate there and produce hairs. And you'll also notice there that light blue structure, which is a sweat gland uh, called an eccrine gland, and we're going to be talking about that more later. The top portion of skin, the epidermis, is shown here in purple and blue, is very cellular. And the, the living epidermis uh, is the purple part, and its job is to produce the stratum corneum, which it does by essentially dying. The slide uh, is a uh, frozen section of the stratum corneum, which shows what a tightly organized structure this is. Um, and this, this is our interface with the external world, and this is our barrier. What you can't see on this slide is that these cells are enveloped by layers and layers of fatty membranes. And for this, we need to return to a drawing. You can think of the, the stratum corneum as like a brick wall in which the uh, cells are the bricks and the material in between the mortar is made up of these very hydrophobic fats uh, that are organized into lipids. And this is what waterproofs us. The figure on the, the right here is a very high power, a very, very high power uh, electron micrograph that shows you what these membranes actually look like. They are the uh, lines that are in the middle of the uh, photograph, the kind of um, uh, fuzzy stuff on either side of it, top and bottom, is what's left of a skin cell. So what happens in skin, which is so remarkable, is that it changes the arrangement that is present in every other part of our body. So the normal arrangement in our body is to have a cell which is enclosed with a plasma membrane, and it also has many membranes inside it, which is um, hydrophobic, meaning these membranes are made of fat and they are not water friendly. Whereas the material between the cells is is uh, uh, fluid and, uh, and it's hydrophilic, it's, it's friendly to water. That situation gets reversed in the stratum corneum. And now 
the, the uh, cells there, because they're dead, uh, have lost all their membranes, and they are now a water-friendly environment, whereas the uh, membranes that are between the cells are now fatty, and they are the hydrophobic compartment. And it's in this way, by interposing this, this fatty seal over our watery body, that we are waterproofed and we hold back the flow of water. The same water barrier also works against several other uh, external assaults, uh, cleeping out of the form of chemicals like allergens and toxins and uh, free radicals that are in our environment. But it has a vulnerability. And the vulnerability is that it is relatively impermeable to small water-soluble compounds, but it's quite permeable to small fatty compounds because uh, this is uh, what holds back water, but it also allows some of these to enter. And this brings us to uh, the issue of pollution. And I think of pollution as a fellow traveler of climate change because they have the same root cause, which is the uh, combustion of fossil fuels to generate energy. And pollution, um, as we uh, will hear later in this mini uh, medical school series is one of the major causes of the morbidity and mortality associated with climate change. So we'll be hearing more about that later. Uh, the image on the right uh, is a picture of the uh, Bay Bridge in San Francisco that was lost in the smog of wildfire smoke from the campfire a couple of years ago. So it turns out when these fuels are burned, they release particles that are coated um, with oily substances, polycyclic hydrocarbons. And these are um, very noxious, we know, when they, are, um, when they enter the airway, they provoke asthma. But we're also just learning in the last same year, the last few years, that these same particles are also noxious to the skin. They can penetrate its barrier and overwhelm its otherwise robust antioxidant defenses. Other air pollutants generated from uh, air pollution, such as nitrous oxide and ozone, are also um, toxic to skin. And um, the ozone I'm talking about is ground level ozone, uh, the bad ozone. We're going to talk about the good ozone a little later. So exposure to air pollution has now been linked to the formation of pigmented spots on facial skin in older people. These are called solar or senile lentigos because they are um, uh, produced in association with damage from sunlight and with aging. But we can now add air pollution as a risk factor for the unwanted changes in our skin as we age. Also, we've learned just in the last few years that both the form of eczema seen in older adults and the common form of eczema seen in children called atopic dermatitis are associated with air pollution, particularly uh, both flares of disease as well as the risk of developing disease uh, in infancy. This link with eczema uh, is interesting in view of the fact that we've known for many years, of course, that these same pollutants uh, are exacerbating flares of asthma. And atopic dermatitis and asthma often coexist in the same people uh, or certainly in the same families. And they share a common pathway for uh, producing disease. So I think it's really not surprising now that we're learning that air pollution, it can also provoke uh, eczema. Uh, acne flares have also been associated with particulate air pollution. Just as uh, applying greasy products to the face can plug our facial pores and promote acne, something we've known for many decades, so also it seems that these greasy microscopic particles of air pollution can have the same effect. Another external threat against which skin must defend itself is sunlight. And in particular, skin's highly energetic ultraviolet rays. These are the major cause of the current skin cancer epidemic. The drawing on the right illustrates the penetration of ultraviolet light into the skin. And as you can see, while the longer wave UVA light can reach through the epidermis and down into the dermis, 
the shorter wavelength UVB, which is more energetic and more strongly linked to skin cancers, does not penetrate past the epidermis. I think perhaps someone should have shown this figure to our president when he was musing about using sunlight to treat COVID-19 infections. Also note that most of the UVB rays do not penetrate past the stratum corneum, that brown layer of cells on the top of this drawing. In fact, 80% of UVB is filtered out by this, the skin's barrier layer, and only 20% reaches the living part of the epidermis where melanin, its protective pigment, is mostly found. Thus, the skin's barrier is also a very potent sun filter. And once again, it's being challenged in our changing world. Sun-induced skin cancers are by far the most common of all human cancers, and these cancers have been on the rise, largely as a consequence of our sun-seeking behaviors. The graph on the right shows the rising incidence of basal cell carcinoma in four European countries. It is the accumulation of years of damage from sun exposures that is linked to these most common of skin cancers, basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. Although less common, melanoma, the cancer of pigment producing cells, is more deadly than either of these two skin cancers. Melanoma is also linked to sun exposures, but this, in this case, they are linked to intermittent and intense exposures like the ones that produce sunburns or that accrue during sun intensive vacations. As with the other two skin cancers, melanoma too has been increasing in epidemic proportions during recent decades. The graph on the left shows the rising incidence of melanoma diagnoses in the US. In part, this can be attributed to improvements in the diagnosis of early cases. Nonetheless, melanoma deaths are also on the rise. Note the steep slope for the curve for Europe and the Americas, which includes both North and South America, and the Western Pacific, which includes Australia. These are regions with large numbers of inhabitants bearing sun-sensitive, lighter pigmentation skin types, a group with higher prevalence of skin cancers of all types. There's every reason to expect that the skin cancer epidemic will continue as we undergo climate change. Warmer temperatures can be expected to lead to more time spent out of doors, especially by children. This is likely to result after a lag of many years in more skin cancers. Also, there's some experimental evidence to suggest that warmer temperatures enhance the carcinogenic effects of UV light. In other words, the same dose of UV light is more damaging to the skin when the temperature is higher. We are protected from much of this ultraviolet light emanating from the sun by Earth's stratospheric ozone layer, the good ozone, which pre prevents penetration of much of this uh, UV light through its shield but you are probably all aware of the holes that have appeared in this ozone layer as a result of the release of CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, from refrigerants and other aerosols into the atmosphere in past decades. While the worldwide ban of these agents has now resulted in both stabilization of the size of these holes and some hope that they are beginning to close, complete resolution at best will not be accomplished until 2050. This means that we have three more decades in which excess UVB will continue to penetrate our atmosphere and induce more skin cancers. That's the bad news about the good ozone. Meanwhile, there is the ground level or tropospheric ozone problem, the bad ozone, or as we commonly refer to it, smog. This ozone is a secondary pollutant which is generated when heat and ultraviolet light interact with other air pollutants like nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide generated from the combustion of fossil fuels. Ozone in contact with the skin can result in depletion of its antioxidant defenses, a state that's called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress can potentiate the ability of UV light to induce skin cancer. For all these reasons, more time spent out of doors, exposure to UV light, and the enhanced carcinogenic effects of warmth and pollution, our deadly epidemic of skin cancer will in all likelihood continue to grow. Skin's water barrier also participates 
in uh, forming its antimicrobial barrier. That successfully uh, prevents the penetration of bacteria, viruses, and fungi, a whole panoply of microorganisms that would happily feed upon us if they could only get past our skin. Skin has a formidable antimicrobial barrier. Its surface is highly acidic with a pH of 4.5 to 5.5 in contrast to the interior of the body, which is nearly neutral at 7.35. This acidity on the skin surface alone inhibits the growth of many disease-causing microbes. Its water barrier, the stratum corneum, also contains a family of proteins called antimicrobial peptides that have the uh, capacity to fend off many microorganisms before they can gain entry to our body. But most cleverly of all, skin hosts a large assortment of friendly microbes on its surface. It's rich and highly variable microbiome. These microbes have entered into a cooperative arrangement with the skin. Skin allows them to live there and feed upon its outermost cells as they are being shed from its surface in exchange for helping to keep the bad microbes from gaining a foothold. Of course, everything in nature has its vulnerabilities and for skin, one of these is a variable platoon of small creatures, mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, that can get around these defenses by biting or drilling through there in order to gain access to a meal of warm blood. Wily viruses and other microorganisms hitch a ride on these biting pests and thereby bypass skin's stout defenses. While skin is alone is not always involved in these vector-borne infectious diseases, it does provide the portal of entry. With changing ecosystems due to climate change, some disease-bearing arthropods are expanding into regions that were once not hospitable to them, and with them can come their diseases. Dengue and Zika are two examples of diseases that are expanding out of the tropics and into the U.S. as their vector, in this case, species of Aedes mosquitoes, move north and into our backyards. The map here shows the present distribution of one species of mosquito that carry the dengue fever virus. While in many areas of the U.S. where these mosquitoes are currently found, transmission of the dengue virus has not yet been demonstrated, it is likely only a matter of time. It takes just enough people who became infected when they traveled to a part of the world uh, to return to these regions of the U.S. and then be bitten by these mosquitoes for the virus to become established in our backyards. If the vector is there, the disease will follow. With that concept in mind, here are three maps showing the potential for this species of mosquito to take up residence in regions, both now and in the future under worst case scenarios that is, if we maintain our present way of life and continue to pollute our atmosphere with carbon. Changing habitats are also behind the spread of disease produced by fungi that live in the soil, such as our valley fever caused by the fungus coccidioidomycosis. Once only found in Arizona, New Mexico, and in the Central Valley of California, this fungus has now moved as far north as Washington State. While valley fever is usually a self-limited respiratory infection, it can become widely disseminated throughout the body, including the skin, and can be deadly. People who are immune compromised are particularly at risk for dissemination, such as those undergoing chemotherapy for cancer or taking one of the new biologic and immunosuppressive medications. Another way climate change impacts skin infections is through extreme weather events and most notably flooding. Minor injuries like cuts and abrasions are the most common casualties during floods, but the, con the contaminated floodwaters can convert simple wounds of the skin into serious infections, both locally and spreading into the bloodstream. Many people would probably put the antimicrobial barrier of skin as its number two most important function after its water barrier. This uh, article appeared in the Washington Post today pointing out how sometimes skin gets involved in infectious diseases 
uh, as a warning sign to us that something is going on internally. We call this skin signs of uh, uh, systemic disease. And in this case, our timely COVID-19 uh, virus now is giving uh, us a hint that it may be present in otherwise well-appearing uh, young adults when it shows up as these peculiar areas of somewhat painful red swellings uh, on the distal extremities, particularly the feet. This is a condition that we think of as chillblains, and actually some of you in San Francisco may have suffered from that. We, we live in the kind of wet, cold climate that can promote the formation of chillblains. But we don't really know why this is happening in COVID-19, but I thought that might be of interest uh, since it's so timely right now. Another way skin and infectious disease are interlinked. And now I'm going to go on to what I was going to say about uh, my feeling that uh, our capacity to sweat is the second most important job of skin, to let us sweat, because that is how we cool ourselves. And we humans are actually unique in our adaptation of this particular gland, the eccrine sweat gland, to use it for thermal regulation. In our primate ancestors, these glands were for the most part found only on their palms on soles, where their watery secretions help us grasp objects. What humans did so uniquely was to distribute these eccrine glands in great numbers over their entire skin surface and then link their secretions to the need for thermal regulation. So when the body senses that it is overheating, signals are sent from a central regulatory site in the brain through the sympathetic nervous system pathway to the skin. There, nerves in close uh, proximity to the eccrine glands release a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then binds to cells of the eccrine gland and stimulates the formation of sweat. Sweat is delivered through the eccrine duct to the surface of our skin, where as it evaporates, it carries away heat. We humans have a unique capacity to dissipate internal heat through the copious secretion of this watery form of sweat. And we need this mechanism because our metabolism is very inefficient. Only about 20 to 30% of the calories we consume uh, and burn are converted into useful activities such as fueling our energy-hungry brains, or muscular work. The remaining 70 to 80% is released as heat, which must be dissipated to the environment if we're going to remain thermal neutral. Sweating is the only means we have to dissipate excess heat when the external temperatures exceed that of the core, which is before us in uh, our heat waves of, of uh, global warming. Yet not all of us have the same capacity to sweat. Newborns generally cannot rely on sweating for thermal regulation, and children, even through adolescence, have a higher set point before they begin to sweat. Women sweat less profusely than men, and sweating in all adults begins to decline in middle age. The elderly have both a higher set point to initiate sweating, but they also produce less volume. In addition, many medical conditions, most notably cardiac insufficiency and diabetes, are associated with an impaired capacity of skin to dissipate heat. In addition, many medications can interfere with skin's mechanisms for heat dissipation. Both drugs, like diuretics that reduce skin blood volume and skin blood flow, which helps uh, radiate heat from the interior of the outside world, and those drugs that interfere with sweat production including a large class of drugs called with anticholinergic effects. These drugs can block the action of uh, acetylcholine and thereby inhibit one's ability to sweat. And as you can see, medications used for a variety of indications have anticholinergic effects. Due to space limitations, I offer only one or two commonly used examples of these sorts of medications. One recent study found that it was not uncommon for the elderly to be on five or more drugs that interfere with their ability to thermoregulate. When sweating fails to cool, heat exhaustion and heat stroke can result. Uh, you heard a lot about that last uh, session. 
Indeed, heat stroke is the most common cause of mortality from extreme weather events. And, and more frequent, more severe, more prolonged heat waves are unfortunately in our forecast as the globe continues to warm. We've been talking about how our skin works to protect us from external assaults and how it will be important for us to protect it from some of the assaults like pollution and ultraviolet light that can injure it and to protect it from biting arthropods that carry diseases, all of which will become increasingly important as climate change advances. Finally, an understanding of its unique capacity to cool us through sweating and how this response is impaired in some people and in some conditions and by some medications will be critical to our well-being in a warming world. I'd like to thank the meeting organizers, Catherine Gundling and Rob Robin Cooper for allowing me to talk about skin and put skin on the map as an organ uh, at risk during climate change. I'd like to also thank my colleagues, Tom Newman and Robert Gould, who are, have been such wonderful uh, mentors in the Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Bay Area's chapter, uh, Tom leading uh, the chapter's environmental committee. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the American Academy of Dermatology and our expert resource group on climate change and environmental issues. I'd like to thank Mona Safati and the Medical Society Consortium. All of these organizations have been an outlet for me uh, to become engaged in working on climate change as a physician uh, in advocacy, as Tom Newman advised us to become engaged this way and deal with our climate anxiety through active engagement. I'd also like to thank Sarah Coates, a colleague uh, who I borrowed many of her slides for this presentation. I want to thank my family, my husband, Peter Elias. Uh, many of the work that I showed you on the barrier is his work, and he has been my mentor and colleague throughout my professional career. I'd like to thank my son, Jack Williams, whose work as a paleoclimatologist uh, to try to understand our current climate change by understanding how our world has adapted to climate change in the past has been an inspiration. And finally, I thank my grandchildren because it's for them that, uh, and their future that I am engaged in climate change. Thank you all so much. Oh, and thanks, I guess, to our president. He was the one who got me involved. Thank you.